Hello and welcome to Unheard. I'm Freddie Sayers. Reverence for Germany has become something of an obsession for the technocratic class in recent decades. The efficiency of Germany, the pragmatism combined with their post-war modesty and their liberal values has made that country the role model for the Blair Clinton era and many generations onwards. As recently as 2020, here in the UK, we were offered a book by British intellectual John Kampfner called How the Germans Do It Better, Lessons from a Grown-Up Country. Well, suddenly, things don't seem to be going so well. In the past week alone, we've seen the German economy enter full-blown crisis mode. Electricity is surging vertically in price, currently at 14 times the normal average. A recession is forecast, inflation is soaring, the whole euro has dipped beneath a dollar in value for the first time. 62% of the German population is dissatisfied with the government and there seems to be no end in sight. So where did it all go wrong? Professor Wolfgang Strieck is one of Germany's most interesting analysts and economic historians. He was a searing critic of the government of Angela Merkel at a time when she was held a universally high esteem. He joins us to share his powerful explanation of how Germany and Europe got into this mess. Welcome, Professor Street. Uh, thank you, yes. So there's obviously a lot to talk about today. It's a, a day when a lot of people are talking about Germany. Our social media feeds are filled with charts, each of which looks more dramatic than the last about the economic situation. So let's start with the short time frame. How did Germany get into this particular crisis, in your view? The war is an important uh, factor, but but more importantly, I think, or or related to it, is the fact that the kind of globalized economy that was dreamed of in the 1990s and then slowly sort of uh, uh, disintegrated in the first two decades of this century, that kind of thing is coming to an end. And, and that has important consequences, especially for the German economy. German economy was based on very long supply chains of simple but exp non-expensive parts that they sort of uh, bought all over the world and then put together into uh, quite sophisticated products uh, which then were exported into a global market that was supposed to be completely free of any barriers uh, to uh, trade, uh, out of which resulted the fact uh, that uh, um, the China is now the most important market for the uh, German export uh, industry. Now, Germany was an export-oriented country, still is, and with two, with these two conditions, long uh, supply chains and open markets, uh, maybe sort of enforced by the fact that since Germany has the euro and weaker countries share the euro, the exchange rate of the euro was artificially low from the perspective of Germany. It should have been higher if Germany was just uh, Germany. Uh, which, which means that they had um, excellent conditions, um, competitive conditions in foreign uh, markets outside of the of the uh, euro uh, area, and inside the euro area you had a what you can call a captive market, which uh, uh, included a, a growing number of countries in East Europe, but also on the Mediterranean. So many of these conditions are breaking away. Professor Streak, let me just try and tease out, because you've mentioned two of those um, interesting ideas. There. The first is almost that Germany became the sort of exa example par excellence of a globalized economy. So it's, it's hyper-reliant on those global s supply chains staying in place and also on the markets being uninterrupted. Tell us a little bit more about that, because it's a result of Germany's sort of post-war history in some way, isn't it? Yeah, also, uh, historically, even before the war, uh, Germany was heavily industrialized in, in terms of the importance of the 
export oriented uh, manufacturing sector. And um, once you're uh, sort of dominant in certain markets like machines, uh, automobiles, and, and so on, it's very hard to lose that, uh, that advantage. Uh, so in the, let's say, beginning in the 1980s and then on into the 1990s, uh, German firms were quite good at um, consolidating their important, their, their uh, power. Uh, in external markets, and 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 to that extent, it might have had something to do with uh, the the, the post-war era, because Germany wasn't much involved in uh, uh, military production, uh, de defense, military adventures, and so on, spending a lot less on uh, the military than the British did or the French, uh, the Americans not not to be mentioned in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, so so um, there was a historical trajectory uh, that, uh, as historical trajectories go, uh, reinforced itself over time. Until now, suddenly, uh, the optimistic assumptions about uh, uh, the uh, uh, openness of the global economy are dissolving into uh, thin air, and that will impose. Uh, an enormous uh, adaptation uh, uh, requirement, uh, change uh, requirement on the German economy, on the German political economy, which uh, uh, will be very, very hard to, to answer. But, but I, I would like to add one more observation. Uh, if I think back uh, to the 1970s, 1980s, I, I think especially the British quality press, if you want to call them, and every 10 years diagnosed Germany to be the sick man of Europe. Um, so, so this is only a sequence in a sequence of such diagnoses, which um, normally didn't really, uh, um, didn't really turn out to be quite accurate. So we'll, we'll see what is going to happen. OK, so with that important caveat in place, let's just finish this history then, because the Merkel era and the era just before it, in other words, the past, you know, we could zoom out and say the past 30 years since the, what is sometimes called the kind of neoliberal order uh, began, really kind of cemented Germany's position as the dominant economy of Europe. Tell us a little bit more about that and how you, talk, you talked about optimistic assumptions. They almost look naive now in, in retrospect. Yeah, uh, naive in the sense that there was a very strong belief uh, that the kind of borderless global economy uh, in which Germany thrived uh, would uh, exist forever. In other words, that globalization had reached uh, a stage where it was irreversible. And, uh, and now one learns basically two, two things. One is that these long production chains, also credit chains, if you want, uh, that are basically ungovernable and very much given to, to crises, to interruptions, to frictions. If you have a global economy, you have no global state to regulate that economy. So you depend on markets that are notoriously difficult to predict. So, so that, that's one, one thing. The, the other thing is that Underlying this idea uh, was that uh, states as, uh, let, let's say, uh, sources of friction in a globalized economy would basically be pushed back into the background. Uh, and now with the, uh, uh, the uh, military tensions that, that have occurred, you suddenly see uh, that uh, uh, globalization may be uh, undone as a result of economic sanctions of the for new formation of blocks in the global economy. Now, now we hear that we should no longer trade with uh, China. Now you can imagine a company like, like Volkswagen, which is selling uh, more cars in China than anywhere else in the world, uh, may, may, may have a real problem. Uh, if the Chinese market is closed uh, for German uh, products, 
uh, maybe in the same way in which the Russian market is now closed for uh, German products and vice versa. In, in which the Germans are no longer able to, to buy from the Russians. And as you know, uh, energy was, was the important factor here. I want to come back to the uh, Ukraine conflict, but there was another element you talked about in your first answer, which was the European Union and, and Germany's position within that. And the fact that in some way there was like a structural advantage to Germany because of the currency in trading with that, that internal market. Will you just explain that for us? The advantage for Germany was that it could operate with an exchange rate uh, that was lower than the German exchange rate would have been uh, if, if Germany had had um, its own currency. Uh, if, if you include weaker countries in a monetary uh, union, uh, then um, uh, from the outside, uh, the, uh, uh, this system looks less uh, competitive than it, than it actually is if you just look at Germany. So th th there is a center periphery difference in this, in this system. And Germany and Northwestern uh, Europe, that in, include, for example, the Netherlands, formed the center of this uh, uh, system. Uh, and there was a periphery. And there still is a periphery, especially the Mediterranean countries. And then you add the uh, new Eastern European countries. In such a, in such a system, uh, being on the periphery uh, means that you're on the re receiving end uh, of a production system that is centered somewhere else, namely in the center of the, of the system. You can call it an imperial structure. Somewhere in the center is where the economic action is. And the periphery is the area. The, the economists believe that in such a system, there would be a natural convergence between the, the center and the periphery. The opposite is true. The, there is a sort of advantage uh, that comes from uh, having an advantage, so to speak. Uh, it, it is re self-reinforcing, um, and in that sense, uh, uh, the, what you what you've seen in the last uh, uh, 10, 15 years, especially after the world economic crisis, is that southern European countries find it extremely hard uh, to continue in this system, although they don't know how to get out of it, and then you then you see political uh, conflicts over what sort of compensation the center is supposed to transfer to the periphery so that the periphery is willing to continue to play the game. Right. I mean, we had Yanis Varoufakis, the former Greek finance minister, on this show, and he certainly signs up to that analysis. And he feels furious that, as he sees it, the Greek economy was kind of balanced in favor of German bankers. And that kind of rhetoric is obviously controversial. Do you think it's fair enough? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, <laughs> in, see, in such a system of nation states, national governments have to, first of all, consider their national interest. Uh, th there's no other way. And, and uh, in many ways, I think, as far as Yanis Varoufakis is concerned, in this whole period, the Greeks insisted that they belonged to the European Union and they wanted to remain members of monetary union. At this point, they sort of simply uh, delivered themselves uh, to the machinations of uh, the center of the union, namely uh, Germany. If, if they weren't willing to actually threaten to blow up the place by, by getting out of it or to uh, to default on the uh, on the uh, credit that they had gotten from German and French banks, they had no uh, potential to uh, to to really negotiate. Yeah, you've used the word imperial in your analogy there. So I suppose the question has to be: if the empire of the centre, which is principally Germany, with France and a couple of other countries attached, starts to crumble and the center becomes weak, what happens to the periphery? Yes, that's a good question. And the answer is pretty straightforward. Uh, in order for an empire to hang together, there must be something like an imperial rent on the part of the center, for, uh, for the benefit of the center that balances or 
exceeds the costs of keeping the empire together. Empires are expensive. You, you, you have to do something for the periphery in order to keep them happy. And that must, in the long term, produce something for you, uh, for, your, for your voters, for your economy, and so on. If these benefits are no longer coming forward, then the willingness on the part of the electorate and the political parties to, to pay the costs of empire will definitely decline. And there's an example in the world, which is the United States, where um, uh, the costs of empire, uh, like free trade and um, uh, China, everybody, uh, uh, China <laughs> exporting everything to, to the United States, where the United States couldn't, couldn't export something back. Trump was the moment when he was elected when the American electorate in its majority uh, pointed out that they now wanted a government that took care not of an empire, but of America itself. That was the idea of America first. The, uh, the, the Trumpian America first thing was not, now we are going to conquer the rest of the world, but it was right to the contrary. Now we are taking care of our country because it is in such a decrepit uh, condition. So what happens, so if you see more of a Germany first government coming in, I don't know if that's even conceivable, but if you see that that, that balance change in the European Union, what could happen? Could the, could the Union break up further? Do you, I mean, what could be the consequences? Well, uh, the Union is already on the brink of of disintegration. Think about uh, the Eastern countries, uh, like Hungary is um, sort of definitely playing the role of uh, spoil sport with respect to, to Brussels. Uh, uh, Poland has its very own ideas of what the European Union is going to be used for, namely to help Poland to, 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 to prosper and, and nothing else. The, the anti-German sentiment both in the East and in the South, is uh, absolutely uh, growing. And it's, it's still growing beyond what it used to be two or three years ago. The, the, the Britain has left. I don't see an ital exit, so to speak, partly because the, the longer you have the euro, the more people have invested in the euro or have indebted themselves in uh, the euro and especially the middle class is is uh, scared stiff of having to return to some national currency but uh, eastern europe definitely uh, now has a very different idea and you you do have to figure in uh, the war in the sense that it is now the united states which um, aligns itself very closely with a country like Poland or, of course, Ukraine, in, insists on the um, West Balkan states to be included in the uh, European the Union, which changes the majority situation in the, and also uh, re requires structure. In, imagine now it's 27 member states them sent a commissioner to, to Brussels so that the European Commission consists of 27 people. They need binoculars to see each other during their meeting. That the, now, now we have six or seven new countries that are on the verge of getting in. They have their own view of what the European Union is about. They will all have to be subsidized by the center. And, and they will all want to send an additional commissioner. Now, already the French and the Germans say, before we can extend the union, we have to uh, have a structural reform. Structural reform means that all 27 countries must ratify uh, a new treaty. Now, that is considered politically absolutely unreal by, by anyone who, who knows that system. The, the result is that I think the European Union will uh, lose in significance for its member states uh, in a gradual process of decay, where uh, increasingly you find uh, 
sort of sub uh, collections of member states like the East, like uh, the Mediterranean, and so on, uh, doing their own thing, which I don't think is is uh, is bad at all. The countries need to remember that they cannot be uh, uh, governed by a government in Brussels, which is basically not uh, responsive to their electorate. We mentioned a little while ago uh, Angela Merkel. Um, I just want to dwell on her for a, a minute because she is someone who sort of stood across that whole era like a colossus. Everyone felt that she was bringing stability and wisdom to the bloc. No one ever had a bad word to say about her. And now, as soon as she's gone, things seem to be collapsing. What's your assessment of her legacy in this context? Should we be more critical than we have been? My, my criticism of German politics at the time and German foreign policy, especially Merkel, was that uh, they uh, sort of tried to avoid problems by suggesting uh, pseudo solutions that everybody could agree to where uh, people who knew what was going on uh, were absolutely able to say that this would only hold for a very short period and then the problem would come back and the italy is a good example but also energy policy is is a is, is a good example in in germany the greens have have dictated uh, energy policy since 1998, when when uh, the, the Schroeder coalition came, came in. And uh, suddenly, uh, the new government, uh, Social Democrats and Greens, uh, suddenly the new government uh, was more concerned about uh, ending nuclear energy than they were about unemployment. And <laughs> I, I remember that very, very vividly. And, and then they had the first nuclear exit in, in, in 1999. Then Merkel came in as a fanatic supporter of nuclear energy until Fukushima, uh, when, when she had in mind that she wanted to change her coalition partner from the uh, Social Democrats to the Greens. And then suddenly within a matter of, of a few weeks, uh, the German nuclear uh, exit was repeated, this time under Merkel which was the reason why uh, the energy had to be uh, bought somewhere else because we couldn't produce it anymore. I mean, this is the one that's really so spectacular now, isn't it? Where we see, you know, it feels so much like a self-inflicted problem that other sources of energy like nuclear have been sort of fast forwarded and shut down. H how do you, do you believe the explanation for that is purely then kind of short-termism and internal politics. The, the Greens were uh, sort of began their history in the 19, I think, 70s, early 1980s, uh, with the anti-nuclear energy protest movement, and 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 so that that's part of what you say today, part of their DNA. The the both the Social Democrats and uh, the Christian Democrats. Uh, wanting to uh, to pull the Greens on, onto their uh, uh, to their side, they sort of were willing uh, to take the risk uh, and uh, pursue this anti-nuclear policy uh, at a time when it was not quite clear uh, where the energy was going to come from. That the German industry, I, I described the German industrial model at, at, at the beginning, where that would be coming from. Uh, yes, and of course there was a lot of, uh, let's say, self-delusion in the German political uh, context. Everybody in the world was uh, applauding uh, the, uh, the great uh, courage of Germany to, uh, uh, to uh, totally uh, change to uh, renewable energy. And so there was one meeting after the other where this was seen as uh, as great political wisdom, uh, and I, I remember when I was uh, when I was at the New School in, in New York, we someone from uh, global uh, climate uh, panel uh, sort of couldn't hold on to himself about when he talked about Angela Merkel, yeah. uh, <laughs> and and now. 
it's sort of the moment that uh, uh, Russian gas isn't coming anymore. Um, and for all sorts of reasons, the, the Americans had been opposing it long before the war. And long before the war started, uh, Germany had come under pressure to no longer buy Russian gas because they wanted to sell the to sell American gas in in in, in, in Europe. So let's let's come to the war. Then this is obviously the thing that has fast forwarded and upended the settlement in Europe. What's your analysis of how Germany and the whole West, I guess, have responded to the military situation in Ukraine? Basically, I think there were long um, uh, conflicts already um, brewing. Uh, for example, uh, since 2002, uh, NATO had, at every NATO meeting, insisted that uh, uh, all NATO members spend 2% of their GDP on uh, military uh, arms, uh, on, on the military. They call it defense. Now, now two percent. Uh, Germany would have had to double its uh, its spending. Um, they never did that because they didn't know why. <laughs> uh, but uh, that was in a period after after the uh, turn of the century, uh, in which the Americans sort of enormously uh, increased their military spending and at the same time uh, cancelled all existing uh, arms control agreements that they had inherited from the time of the Soviet Union. Yeah. So there was something going on. Uh, in the, the war on terror was going on. Uh, NATO was rededicated uh, in, I think, in 2000 uh, to, uh, to, from uh, territorial defense uh, to uh, uh, an, an, an alliance that was uh, ready and willing uh, to intervene at any place in the world at any time. Yeah, and that was the, the rewriting of the NATO chart. Extraterritorial. Uh, th th that meant that, for example, in uh, Afghanistan, the German troops could go uh, under the NATO uh, label. And in uh, uh, and, 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 and suddenly for the Germans, the, the, a new situation arose, namely that you, uh, rather than just defending your own country, you were asked to go all sorts of, to, to go to all sorts of places. The, then the German social democratic defense minister told Germans that the freedom of Berlin is being defended on the Hindu Yeah, That was the formula. And, and it was difficult to sell to people because it, it sounded so uh, uh, bizarre. Outlandish, yeah. Yeah, 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 sounded bizarre. Uh, Angela Merkel typically sort of promised all the time that Germany would from now on spend 2%. At the same time, she didn't do anything. She had this sort of in, unique ability uh, to make promises uh, without keeping them, yeah. Then, uh, uh, when when uh, Russia uh, took uh, the Crimean Peninsula, uh, it, basically I think everybody could have known uh, that now something would happen. If you look at the statistics, you see that that uh, from that moment on, uh, the American military was sort of very deeply involved in the build up of the Ukrainian uh, military. There's no state in the world that between 2014 and now uh, sort of spend, it had a higher increase in military spending than Ukraine. Yeah? And it was all sponsored by the United States. Um, so, so there was something breeding. Yeah? But the way politics works... Uh, would they not no, say, uh, Professor, just to, I don't mean to yeah. interrupt, but would they not say that something breeding was that Russia had at that point invaded a, a country that was considered a sovereign nation, and therefore it's natural that they would want to spend a lot more on, on defense and you know, ramp up the defenses now that that threat was so apparent. Yeah, it's also, there's, there's this thing, and then there is this idea that is usually accepted that countries have to have a sort of security zone uh, where they have to have some sort of uh, military, let's say, 
con, con, uh, agreement on what happens in uh, uh, on the border. So you can't put up uh, you can't put up uh, missiles uh, on the American border in, in in Cuba. That is impossible, or or in Venezuela. And I think that uh, uh, historical research now about the 1990s shows that uh, American policy very slowly from the uh, Partnership for Peace, which, which was the American concept of post-Soviet Europe uh, after 1990, sort of shifted to this idea that whoever wants to join NATO can join NATO and that we will never make a commitment not to do something uh, in military respect in any NATO member country. Yeah? Uh, so, so now in the last uh, five to 10 years, uh, we even had this American uh, effort to put up uh, intermediate nuclear missiles uh, in, in Romania and in uh, Czechia and in Poland. Yeah? That, that, that must have made uh, life uh, extremely uh, um, un, un, unpleasant on the, in, in the, if you if you let's say allow the standards uh, of um, um, general staff uh, of a big country. So you you would you would agree then more with the kind of John Mearsheimer position that it, in some way that it's explained by provocations and, and there are mitigating factors is how you would see it. Yeah, I, I don't even know about provocations because I don't know what they, what the, the sort of strategies they, they have in the American military apparatus. But to me, uh, if I look at uh, the way the map of Europe evolved since 1990 with respect to, uh, uh, to military uh, and political alliances, then the situation of Russia uh, has become more uncomfortable every year. Professor, if we can go back to Germany then, what what does this mean for Germany and for the European Union? We've got a winter coming with enormously high energy costs and God knows how countries like Germany are going to get through that. How does this square with the ongoing sanctions against Russia? Do you think they will crumble? Do you think public opinion will sh break in terms of quote unquote, standing with Ukraine. What, what do you think is most likely to happen next? I, 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 uh, I can't tell you because war, if there's anything that you know about wars is that they can take the strangest, most unexpected turns. Yeah? And, and what I would say is they, they feed on, the, on themselves. Wars take longer, always take longer than it is expected when they begin. So the Russians may have thought that it takes about three weeks to, to get to Kiev and, and then the thing is over. Yes, uh, the Germans in 1939 thought that they would be at home uh, by Christmas. Uh, and the same in the First World War. Yeah. Why do wars feed on themselves? Because the war itself uh, causes, yeah, uh, you can say, Hatred and and the need for revenge. There there are people dying. Yeah, the, the 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 longer such a thing continues, the more difficult it becomes uh, to, to 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 try to reach out and make an agreement. Uh, and at least not uh, un unless everybody everybody is so exhausted after uh, like in the first world war that that they couldn't go on anymore. And th th that's absolutely uh, frightening. So, so how long this is going to take? I have no idea. Uh, whether whether the the German government was my impression sort of has has the problem that they would like to have a say on what the objective of the defense of Ukraine against Russia is. Uh, for example, uh, is the uh, the, the, is it uh, part of the war goals, war aims, uh, expelling Russia from the Crimea or not? Yeah. Is there uh, the possibility uh, of ending the war with some sort of uh, uh, special status of the Russian uh, 
uh, inhabited areas uh, in the east of of, of Ukraine. Yeah. Um, is uh, what I think. If I look at the map, in fact, adding to this is uh, is Belarus. Belarus nobody talks about, but Belarus is almost as big as 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 Ukraine. It is on the border of also uh, sort of willing to move into Europe. If the dictatorship there ends, then it is very likely to be a, a government that will also become a NATO member. Yeah. And unless you have some sort of peace agreement uh, with some elements of neutrality uh, in this whole area that includes uh, these, these countries, then it will always be extremely volatile. Remember that uh, uh, Crimea includes the, uh, the most important uh, uh, military port uh, of, the, of, of Russia, uh, Sevastopol. Uh, Sevastopol is located on the Crimea. If, if you, uh, this was one reason why uh, I think it would have been unacceptable for Russia uh, if Ukraine, including Crimea, would join the European Union and ultimately NATO, you you would have your, mili your most <laughs> important military uh, uh, harbor sort of in the hands of uh, of a member state of the European Union and, and 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 NATO. So it's potentially quite a bleak prospect. If if you're right that the that this war might go on for a lot longer than people originally hoped. But more than that, the economic consequences of it and the, the reorganizing of Europe, wh where does that end? How do you think that plays out? Because you've written in your writings about maybe the beginning of kind of new dark ages post the kind of capitalist golden era. Is it as, it is as grave as all that? Yeah, I, you mentioned John, John Mearsheimer, who, who at the end of, uh, of an important lecture on this, that he gave at, at the European University in, in Florence. He said that this is an absolute tragedy and it could become, uh, it, it, it could become a real long lasting disaster. Yeah. And, and I would not want to, uh, to, uh, to, to say the opposite. Yeah. The more this war sort of reinforces it, it feeds on itself. Uh, you, you, there's no pre, there's no prediction. Um, Clausewitz, I mean, <laughs> Clausewitz, the great theorist of wars, sort of keeps repeating every page that the war wars are uh, accidents, uh, machines, machineries that produce. We would say now random outcomes, one after the other, unpredictable. In terms of the the Europe with Germany at the center. That's how we've been accustomed to sort of thinking about the world. There was the US, then there was Europe with a very strong Germany in the middle. And then, you know, there was Russia and the rest of the world. Do you think what we're witnessing is actually a kind of big scale change in the, in the geopolitical structure? I mean, what happens to a, to a Europe in the medium or long term future without that structure? You were asking what, what happens to Europe in the situation that, that is beginning to, to shape up. Namely, we have uh, China on the one side, the United States on the other. And what are we doing? Yeah. If, if that war continues, then we will have a division of the Eurasian continent on the now Russian border. But then what will be east, side, east of that border is not Russia. It is a Russian-Chinese alliance where the, China, where the Chinese call the shots because Russia will become dependent on them if we don't do trade with them anymore. Yeah? And, and uh, then where is European, where, you can also ask, where is European strategic autonomy without some sort of settlement with Russia that allows Russia to maintain some sort of independence from the Chinese? So you actually think it's safer for Europe to do some kind of compromise with Russia in their own self-interest? I think uh, it's not only me that thinks that. I think that this is the French, uh, uh, the, the French position all the time. Macron goes to meetings of the European heads of, of government 
and says something we have to allow Putin to save face in order to have some to have some agreement with it. That that makes sense from the position if you want Europe to be more than an ally of the United States. Yeah. That what what is now perhaps coming is that the Eurasian continent will be divided between a zone of influence of China and the zone of influence of the United States. And and what what you get is sort of Europe as an auxiliary force in the upcoming battle between the uh, United States and China, where uh, the, someone like Macron, that's the way I read him, uh, would absolutely prefer to be able to stay outside of that battle and develop some sort of independence in Europe. Yes, I think that's the choice. And it may not even be a choice because the way things have evolved up to now, the option of uh, some sort of strategic uh, uh, autonomy of, of, of Europe may long be gone. And, and as long as that war in Ukraine goes on, the greater the, the dependence will be of Western Europe uh, on the United States and vice versa. Uh, the, the greater the dependence of Russia will become on, on China. And then sort of 100 kilometers east of, of Kiev, we will have a border where on the other side of the border will be a Russian-Chinese uh, conglomerate. Like a new Cold War then, like a, a return to much more like the Cold War era. Yeah, uh, the, the Cold War was uh, uh, somehow uh, limited to uh, to Europe and environs, but that new thing will really be global. Uh, and and the, a few days ago, you, you saw a, sort of a very bizarre spectacle, which was five Eurofighters of the German army, a German, uh, a German Air Force, so flying all the way from Germany to Australia to show their uh, loyalty. Uh, to the United States, uh, getting ready for the Eastern, uh, for the for the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, or Chinese Sea uh, confrontation. Yeah. Five planes, which is completely symbolic, but but they even they even took a tanker plane with them that that refueled them on the way to show that they can go. And and that that to me is is a, a symbolic demonstration of Germany and the European, uh, uh, Western European subcontinent uh, turning into uh, an auxiliary force of the United States in its upcoming, uh, uh, yeah, what, confrontation war with China. You've been very good humoured painting this picture, Professor. Um, my final question for you is, is there anything to be good humoured about? looking at this future, as you painted, it looks quite frightening, uh, unsafe, and a deterioration of the world as it used to be. Uh, am I being too negative or is that? No, fair? no, no, no. I, uh, I joke about it in order not to cry about it. <laughs> but, but if you ask me, and and there I, I fully agree with Mearsheimer actually that, that I mean I mean he is sometimes he is sometimes uh, sort of quite brutal in in, in 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 what he says, but I was impressed with uh, the uh, the sense of alarm and even despair with which he looks at this. Yeah. He's, he is not a partisan of any of the of the two sides. He, he analyzes what is going what is going on, and then at the end he says, "I have no idea how we get out of this. Let's pray that we that we will, but uh, there's no guarantee." And I would fully subscribe to this. Professor, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. That was Professor Wolfgang Strick who is one of the foremost analysts and critics of the German foreign policy and government approach of the past few decades. I thought what he had to say was frightening, frankly, that 
the only way he sees this playing out is towards a bifurcated world with an American sphere of influence and a Chinese sphere of influence and Europe ending up as a, as a middleman uh, on the American side. Um, I don't know if he's right, but it was fascinating to hear. Thank you to him and thanks to you for tuning in. This was Unheard Ideas.